Milé kolegyně, kolegové, já začnu nejdřív česky eh, organizačními eh, připomínkami. Prosím vás, posledně jsme to zapomněli říct a zase se nám to zle nevyplatilo. Eh, přednáška bude trvat asi 50 minut, to znamená, naplánujte si odjezd svého vlaku tak, abyste neodcházeli z přednášky, opravdu to není příliš citlivý vůči tomu přednášícímu. Potom bude čas ještě na dotazy, to bude samozřejmě záležet na vás, kolik dotazů budete mít, ale samotná přednáška je naplánována asi na 50 minut, tak prosím, vytavejte, neodcházejte. A there colleagues, friends, students, I am really proud. Uh, we can host today Rachel Weiss with her lecture in our faculty. So Rachel, thank you for your coming to Ustí na We are really happy to have you here. Uh, uh, Rachel Weiss is uh, um, Uh, first of all, from our academic uh, perspective, Professor Emerita at School of Arts, Art Institute of Chicago, which is one of the most prestigious artistic uh, and art history uh, universities related to a very good institution, also exhibition institution. Uh, Rachel is writer, educator, uh, art historian and also curator. Uh, I would like to mention some books she edited, at least two of them. One we have uh, in our library, so if you would uh, like to uh, know more about uh, Rachel and her work, uh, go to university library and uh, try to take from the library book which uh, is named, uh, entitled uh, Making Art Global, the Serb Havana Biennial. So please continue to study Rachel work from our sources. And I would like also mention her last book published uh, last year, 2021, because this book will be, uh, on, on this book, uh, Rachel will be focused during her lecture. Uh, book is entitled, Know What? Quandaries of Art and the Radical Past. Uh, Rachel will shortly uh, introduce you to the, to the concept of the book and then she will be concentrated on one selected chapter from the book and the title of the chapter is Whoever Knows the True Lies after October 1977 West Germany in Germany in autumn and October 18th 1977. Tak shortly uh, I will introduce the topic. Ti z vás, uh, kteří tuší, o čem lekce bude, uh, bude o uh, historické události, která je spojená s, uh, s frakcí uh, rudých brigád a jejich uh, aktivitami v Německu, ale především také jejich uměleckou reflexí sérii obrazů Gerharda Richtera, který uh, zpracoval vlastně tohle, tohle téma a reagoval na něj. So, thank you. You came to the lecture, and Rachel, please, you can start with your lecture. Hi. If you have trouble hearing me, or if I'm speaking too fast, please, like, let me know. <clears throat> so thank you to Michal and Zdena and Christina for your help in making this event possible. I'm really happy to be here. Um, what I will do is um, I'll start by talking a little bit about why I wrote this book, um, what I was thinking, what I was trying to figure out, and then I'm going to read from um, the chapter that deals with events in West Germany in the late 1970s. And the first section that I read will, will give you some um, background to understand who these people were, what they did, what the reaction was, and um, how that led to these artworks that were made about them. <clears throat> so, um, and I, I made just a few kind of keyword slides, um, knowing that English is not your first language, so hopefully it will help just to um, orient But again, if, if, if you're losing the thread, please let me know and I'll slow down. Okay, <clears throat> so the book began for me um, actually quite a few years ago, probably about 12 years ago now. 
And it was during a few days I was at a conference in Lima, Peru. I was there to work with a group of young art historian researchers who called themselves the Network of Southern Conceptualisms. And they were making an exhibition about the disappeared histories of artistic militancy that was in opposition to the dictatorships and state violence in 1980s Latin America. That group of mostly young researchers had convened to share their findings with each other and to fit the pieces together into a whole, into the exhibition. The, the intensity of that meeting was such that I became literally unable to speak, um, which for me never happens. Um, it was clear to me that the project was not just an act of historical vindication, since these were histories that cut to what was for these young people an anguished core of a legacy that they felt on very intimate terms. For one thing, many of them, their parents had been militants and um, some of them had been murdered or disappeared. So it was quite personal for them. After that, I began to notice more and more of these acts of return to radical pasts. And I got curious about what was driving that. And so the book focuses on works that return to four different historical watersheds. All of them, in my opinion, foundational and precipitate moments in the history of 20th century radical politics, namely the Cuban Revolution, Salvador Allende's Chile, its destruction and also the structures of its forgetting, the thwarted 1989 revolution in Romania, and the cascading reactions in post-World War II West Germany, the denial of the Nazi past and the ways that that came to shape and to deform ideas of justice in the next generation. <clears throat> I noticed that some of the artworks reprising those pasts had really stuck with me, that I was upset by them or not able to, um, to close the book on them. They were works that hit a nerve. They resonated with something I felt deeply, but also that I felt very unresolved about. Those works are tellings about and from societies that had much to fear from the past, and for that matter, from themselves and their capacity to inflict such tremendous harm. They raised lots of questions for me, and here I had identified a few types of those questions, namely questions about remembering, representing, repeating, returning, and relating, about generational succession and inherited pasts and pasts that are missing, and about the traumas of messianic hope. They opened up questions about the very possibility of telling and about the relation of telling to healing. It becomes immediately clear that we're faced with the quandary of how it might be possible to tell these pasts, given that trauma resists telling by its very nature. And so these works straddle the dialectic between the impossibility and the urgency of really knowing the ordeals that they tell. I began to see that above all, they're frames that make telling possible. Their consistency is in their fragility, told in languages made of pauses and fragments, told in a confusion of past and present, and in a time of non-historical form 
in which then and now punctuate each other. They're told in minor voicings, I think because they live in the time of consequences, deeply personal, but not in the business of revelation or certainty. Their claim is not of pure seeing, but of a kind of seeing that's born of the lived interplay and tension between hope and fear. They tell of that dynamic with an immediacy and an urgency that as I came to see it, their condition of being afterward demands. The works all share a condition of being afterward, so their telling's in the wake. They tell what I think of as the undersong of these histories, of the wreckage of emancipatory hopes and energies and the consequences of that. And they tell in these kinds of languages so they might offer a different way to live afterwards. Quarrels flicker throughout those incursions from the destroying past, but these tellings hold fast their relation to those difficult and suspended projects, respecting the ways that they've touched the world. So the book began <clears throat> as an attempt to understand why we return to the radical past, um, especially to radical pasts that have been lost to us, and I also wanted to understand what it might be that we want from those pasts, to understand what work they can or cannot actually do. But although at first I was focused on those processes of reclamation, of like returning to those pasts, over time the center shifted to the experience of the loss itself. which is what forms the desire to go back. From reclamation, in other words, to trauma's tailwind. As it happened during the years I was working on the book, the world that I live in, that we all live in, began to change in radical and fearsome ways. For example, I was working on the chapter that I'll be reading from today just as Trump was being inaugurated. And so the fears that I had been thinking about, that bewilderment of loss, the anguish of living in a condition of aftermath, that gradual narrowing of hope shot into a future that's radically unknown, that all became very real and concrete. That's probably at least part of the reason that I don't presume an endpoint of resolution or healing. While those are desirable outcomes in the abstract, it seems more honest to admit that we're always on the way to them and never quite arriving. Such paths are never fully reconciled. So by looking carefully at how creative and poetic expressions can tell those stories, I found that they open a territory of experience in between the extremes of malignant repetition and chimeric release. Not asking these histories to provide the answers we need in the present, the tellings that I look at in the book instead find ways to live with their pasts and to survive them with neither illusion nor disillusion. So the chapter I'll be reading from today is called Whoever Knows the Truth Lies. And that's a phrase taken from a declaration made by a group of West German filmmakers in the immediate aftermath of the events of October 18th, 1977. And I will explain more about what those events were. But briefly, on that day, um, imprisoned members of a group calling itself the Red Army Faction, which was also known as the Bader Meinhof Group. Um, it was a violent, hard left um, group. There were a number of members, um, and they were in prison, and on October 18th, 1977, they were found dead in their cells. The 
West German government suggested and in fact insisted that they were suicides, although this, this has never been actually resolved. Um, meanwhile, their comrades who were not in prison had kidnapped a guy who was one of the primary industrialists of the West German economy, also a former Nazi, by the way. Um, and the day after the Red Army faction members were found dead, this guy who had been kidnapped by their comrades was also found dead. So it was this cataclysm in the country. Um, the filmmaker's comment, namely, whoever knows the truth lies, referred to what had been a massive propaganda campaign and equally um, an information blackout that the West German state had been maintaining during the length of the battle against the Badermeinhof group. Um, that group of filmmakers set out to make a film which they called Germany in Autumn, which was a response to that violence and to the paranoia, misinformation, and also militarization of that period. Their film is the subject of the first part of the chapter that I'm reading from today. Um, the section I will be reading pertains to another artwork, which is a suite of paintings by Gerhard Richter from 1987, so in other words, 10 years after all of this, these events, um, which he titled October 18th, 1977, after the day on which this all happened. <clears throat> So, okay. The basics of the story are this. The Red Army Faction, also known as the Bader Meinhof Group or Gang, arose somewhere in the midst of the waning of the 1968 student movement and concurrently with radical cadres elsewhere. Frustrated by the ineffectiveness of just words, as they put it, as a means of changing the world, the RAF was founded in a logic of vindication in which armed rebellion now would compensate for the virtual absence of violent resistance in Germany to the Nazi regime. In this capacity, lethal violence promised to liberate RAF members from the psychological and political burdens of the past and break the chain of German guilt. The act of being criminals was the founding gesture of the group identity. The RAF didn't withdraw into a private utopia like many of their peers. They grabbed center stage in the public imaginary and consciousness. Their questions were exacting, but their answers were not, amounting only to a generalized anti-imperialist politics and an anti-authoritarian denunciation of West Germany. The overall idea was that they would provoke the West German state to the point that it would shed its constitutional democratic camouflage and show itself for the fascist entity that they claimed it really was. That in turn would detonate also, as they put it, in the consciousness of the masses. As many have pointed out, both at that time and ever since, the absence of a revolutionary proletariat or any other mass to mobilize in the stolidly bourgeois, materialist, and politically allergic post-war West German population made this a dubious strategy. And in fact, the RAF had little contact even with other elements of the extra-parliamentary opposition, which was a kind of coalition of, um, of dissident groups. <clears throat> what mutes the triumphalism of this argument, though, is the fact that the country had undergone only a sketchy process of denazification after 1945. The RAF's targets, namely the corporate sphere, the judiciary, and the government, were in fact well-known havens 
for former high-ranking Nazis who had never been held accountable for their pasts. The RAF were vehement most of all in their self-affirmations. Armored against doubt, as Peter Wolin saw it, driven by fear of what might happen if their certainties were abandoned, desperately struggling to maintain their sense of self, afraid of each other's contempt, they staggered from idealism to self-destruction. The RAF and the West German state traded accusations of fascism across a vehement divide an abyssal and impossible gap. Their early actions met with some sympathy and support, especially among young people and intellectuals, among other things bringing what one author calls a sense of adventure into the boring everyday life of the Federal German Republic. But their escalation from pranks to arson to bank robbery to bombing kidnapping and murder soon resulted in the small band that the RAF was, all of them children of solidly bourgeois homes, the core of West German society, becoming widely seen as an existential threat. In response to their goading, the West German state geared up an apparatus that effectively demolished the idea of civil liberties and the rule of law, all under the alibi of the crisis. And meanwhile, the whole premise of leftist politics was anathematized by virtue of association. Things moved very fast. The RAF's May 1972 offensive spurred a huge manhunt with 130,000 police searching for them. They were, they numbered 20 something people, 130,000 police. That entailed various forms of surveillance, police sweeps, checkpoints, roadblocks, raids, and more. Any advocacy of the group was criminalized and texts even debating armed struggle were prohibited to circulate. All this brought the experience directly into the lives of the vast majority of the population. A choking atmosphere of fear, paranoia, and suspicion settled into not only public, but also private space. By mid-June of that year, all the principal figures were in jail. And from then on, the RAF became its own subject. With the first generation in custody, the fledgling offspring cells mobilized, but not against US imperialism or the Vietnam War or the Palestinian cause or the shallow legitimacy of the West German government. Not, these were all sort of um, idealistic political platforms of leftist opposition movements of the time. Um, not against the shallow legitimacy of the West German government not for socialism, a non-consumerist society, nuclear disarmament, or an end to psychiatry, but rather around the sole imperative of freeing those in prison. So, um, the so-called German autumn ensued in 1977 six weeks or so of havoc that was set off by the kidnapping of the business magnate Hans Martin Schleier. A news blockade was imposed after he was taken and the scant information that was allowed to circulate served mostly as a rhetorical vehicle for asserting an imagined national community of total solidarity against the internal threat. The spectacle came to a close in October with the hijacking of a Lufthansa plane by commandos <clears throat> of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, whose demands included the release of the RAF prisoners. The plane wound up in Mogadishu, where it was stormed by West German special forces. 
the passengers were freed and the commandos were killed. And the next morning, Bader, Enslin, and Raspe, the three members of RAF who were in prison, their corpses were found in their cells, apparent suicides. Schleier's body was found the next day. The question of suicide or murder has never been settled. The vociferous and extensive debate about it all meant that even in death, the RAF continued to haunt the nation and to dominate public dialogue. It granted them the final prize, vaulting from iconicity to immortality. They died young and famous or infamous under circumstances clouded with suspicion, with their deaths captured in chilling photographs ripe for iconic processing and complex myth-making. Seen in these terms, the RAF precipitated the first modern version of the War on Terror and of the performance of that in the form of a media circus. So, a decade later, Gerhard Richter kicked the storm back up with his suite of paintings named after the date on which things had come to a head, October 18, 1977. There are 15 canvases, and all their images would have been instantly recognizable to any West German at the time. Although some of them are clearly sequenced, something like film stills, he was insistent that there was no prescribed order in which they should be hung. The works are, as he put it, a cycle without beginning or end. Although the painter has insisted that his work be seen as non-ideological and apolitical, he also said he hoped that seeing these pictures would not be the same as seeing an accident on the motorway and driving slowly simply because one is fascinated by it. I hope, he said, that there's a difference and that people get a sense that there's a purpose in looking at those deaths because there is something about them that should be understood. Although the painter has insisted that there's a purpose in looking at these deaths, that there's something that should be understood, none of the images show any of the actions, the crimes, the shootouts, the trial, none of that, none of the context. And none of them show the RAF figures with one another or with anyone else. And they're already dead in most of the images. Although the painter has said that these pictures possibly give rise to questions of political content or historical truth, he followed that statement with this, neither interests me in this instance. Although the painted images are all taken from photographs, the painter blurs them, sometimes to the point of illegibility. The paintings are all gray, and of that color, Richter has said that it has the capacity that no other color has to make nothing visible. Still quoting him. To me, gray is the welcome and only possible equivalent for indifference, non-commitment, absence of opinion, absence of shape. We see them before and after their deaths, but not the deaths themselves. Except in the case of Meinhof's shape, very indistinct, hanging. We know, we only know that it's a hanging figure because we know that that's how she died, hanging from a rope that cannot be discerned in the painting. The triad of images of Enslin has her at first looking our way, but not directly, as she does in the second image. The source photos were shot in court following her arrest, 
So it's strange that in the middle image, she seems to smile an open, not ironic or taunting face. The last of these images has her looking down such that we can't even guess at her emotions, yet the grouping is titled Confrontation. With regard to Meinhof, we see her young, pensive, and innocent. And then we see her dead, lying face up on the cell floor three times, with the rope mark across her neck centered in the frame. These images darken progressively, and by the third and final one, the floor itself has blacked out enough that some have read the image as her floating or levitating, like an angel. <clears throat> we see Botter's bookshelf and the record player, which is allegedly where he hid the gun with which he is said to have shot himself. And then we see him splayed on the floor, Christ-like, twice. Seven of the 15 images show corpses, and those images are painted from the official police photos that had been circulated as clinical proof of their suicides. Consequently, some have read the blurring as an indictment of those photos' veracity. Richter had used the same smudging technique before to paint images of clouds and waves, uh, things that in themselves have no clear or stable outlines. We see their funeral. Oops, sorry, that's... We see their funeral, but the only reason we know that's what we're looking at is because the title says so. In comparison to this one, the other images seem reasonably focused and legible, and so if we take the funeral as the logical conclusion to the narrative, we end in radical doubt. Richter does a lot to play things down. First, of course, there's the fact of the gray, that anti-definitional proxy, but he doesn't leave it at that. The subjects of the paintings are hyper-theatrical, but the titles are deadpan in the extreme. The seriality of the images, the repetition, suggests a certain sameness or similarity among them, working against any dramatic narrative grain pointing life toward death. He doesn't seem to believe that either technology in the form of photography or painting can position us to truly witness or understand things. So he reminds us in each frame that we can't even really see. <clears throat> Gertrude Koch reads the question in these terms. If reality cannot be understood, then the most adequate picture of it would be that with the fewest semantic promises. At the end, all that remains of its contents is what Krakauer calls the spatial configuration of the moment, in other words, the awareness that something did once exist. Eric Kliegerman appeals to the Freudian concept of Deckerinnerung, screen memory, to understand what's going on, an act of memory that strikes us as strange, as he puts it, in part because there's a feeling of surprise at the heart. The overexposure of the original photographs, he contends, had turned them into cliches shorn of their initial power to represent actual events. Querying them, then, was Richter's way of reinvesting them with a new symbolic power displaced from their original context. The paintings dwell in twilight, a noctilucent time of unease, a light that softens nothing. Post-memory, says Kleigerman, is based not on the invisible, but on the barely visible that provokes an uncanny shudder of what's vaguely familiar. <clears throat> In 1975, Richter had written, 
that he first produced gray paintings as an expression of his own miserable state of uncertainty, but then came to see it just like shapelessness, he said, as something that can only notionally be real. Gray is simultaneously real and unreal, says Peter Wallen, committed and uncommitted. In the gray photo-based work, the real is given a transcendental side. Each object has its own particular mysteriousness, becoming a metaphor as it melts away into an incomprehensible reality. That incomprehensibility lies at the heart of Richter's morning images, lyrical, elusive, and unconsoled, wearing their belatedness as a kind of unreconciled yearning. The paintings are like an indirect archive, giving less to sight, a decelerated and delayed evocation. It's as if the painter is saying, come with me, but then he leaves us stranded in the unknown and unknowable place that his pictures insist on. On account of that determined elusiveness, they gave rise to a chorus of very determined anger. Speaking of some Holocaust studies, Jeffrey Hartman noted that their trafficking in feelings of mystery and enigma pushes them over the line from protectiveness to protectionism, a line that Richter would seem to deny. The paintings had first appeared in a small provincial museum without warning and without fanfare, but nonetheless provoked a scandal. They reawakened, and keep in mind this is 10 years already after everything, everyone was dead basically. They reawakened the old debate about the RAF a subject that, as many claim, had become taboo, acting like a lightning rod for the fears and fantasies that came back to life in a flash. A memory unhindered by shock was still apparently impossible. The images isolate their subjects from one another, from their victims, from their context, from their consequences and the figures are shrouded in an ambiguous atmospheric blur that can as easily be read as empathetic as distancing or critical. Ambiguity was enough of a problem, but in this case, people felt that Richter had gone further into martyrological, iconic, hagiographic territory. This became even more of a problem once the works were sold to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, since the viewing public there would not come to the images with the knowledge of history that it was claimed was necessary in order to not misunderstand. And in fact, Peter Sheldahl, writing at the time in Art in America, referred to what he called Richter's distinctive tone, a depressive density, resulting from a head-on collision of irresistible aestheticism and immovable moralism, the fire of the voyeur and the ice of the Puritan. So that's exactly the misunderstanding that had been feared. All enmity should cease after death. Mayor Rommel, who was the guy who actually allowed the bodies to be buried, um, it's a long story, but anyhow, so um, an important figure in this history said, once they're dead, people should stop being angry about it. But that had turned out to be impossible. For his part, Richter explained himself telegraphically. He had lived for 13 years under Nazi rule and then for 16 in East Germany, and so was very familiar with overheated ideological environments and with the seductive lure that comes from their denial of uncertainty or ambiguity. In his notes for the exhibition's press conference, this is what he wrote. December 7th, 1988, what have I painted? Three times Bader's shot, 
Three times Enslin hanged. Three times the head of the dead Meinhof after they cut her down. Once the dead Mainz. Three times Enslin, neutral, almost like a pop star. Then a big, unspecific burial, a cell dominated by a bookcase, a silent gray record player, a youthful portrait of Meinhof, sentimental in a bourgeois way. Twice the arrest of Mainz, forced to surrender to the clenched power of the state. All the pictures are dull, gray, mostly very blurred and diffuse. Their presence is the horror of the hard-to-bear refusal to answer, to explain, to give an opinion. I'm not so sure whether the pictures ask anything. They provoke contradictions through their hopelessness and desolation, their lack of partisanship. Ever since I've been able to think, I have known that every rule and opinion, insofar as either is ideologically motivated, is false, a hindrance, a menace, or a crime. <clears throat> Normally, it wouldn't matter that much what an artist intended as their work's meaning, but in this case, it was a central preoccupation. In most West German responses to the paintings, their refusal to declare themselves was felt to be inexcusable, while in the United States, the commentary absorbed their ambiguity into an aesthetic framework. This is a story about moving to and from radicalism and fervency, in which the inverse journey is no less driven and no less prefigured by the energies and commitments of those originary events. This is a history in which the figure of return is a primary architecture and at various points that doubling has signaled everything from reassertion to refutation. The manic feel of the films and the spectral feeling of the paintings suggest that going back to this particular past is engaging with a force that actively haunts the present. The RAF had performed their own act of return, linking post-war Germany to the Nazi era that was a belated encounter coming so many years after the end of the war. And then in their wake, there was this multiply involuted recurring process of return. Although it's difficult to name the propelling feeling of either the film or the paintings, we can at least recognize something akin to anguish, which is most of all a state of affective paralysis. Anguish obstructs our ability to learn from history, and it's the need to do exactly that which has fueled all these works that have gone back to the black box of the RAF's meaning. <clears throat> it seems that perhaps it's been preferable to lock down into anguish than to risk an open battle with this past. It's sometimes the case that stories can, at least for a while, order are still incoherent, unrequited needs, but it's also possible that these returns were premature, more a matter of requiems than anything else. I think I'll stop there. So it's kind of heavy, but I would love to hear your thoughts, questions, comments. So I have one question, which is uh, uh, related to the Gerhard Richter paintings, which are without any doubt so visually strong. Do you believe that contemporary art still has this uh, uh, possibility to create such a strong images because you know the visuality has changed? Right. Uh, uh, when he did these paintings, there was no uh, internet, nothing like that. So also our perception of images is completely different. Could 
what, what do you think is still out work uh, able to, to create such a powerful uh, representation like he did? I mean, I'm tempted to turn the question around to all of you and ask you. I mean, you're looking at crappy reproductions of paintings, but um, before I do that, I'll just say a couple things. Um, first, when I first saw these paintings, they stopped me cold. I mean, it was a really very intense experience. Um, and um, I haven't seen them for many years, but what, the question that you're asking is sort of a question about art in general, not just about Richter. And every once in a while, I have an experience of art that does that. Um, <laughs> so I haven't given up. Um, even like old art, like paintings or um, stuff made in other centuries, every once in a while there's an experience which is um, undeniable. So, um, so it's a very personal response, but my experience is is that yes, it is very much, I mean, this is what keeps me returning to artworks, um, looking to see if that can happen in a way. But I'm curious, for those of you um, for whom these are new images, like, did they get you at all? Well, this year I was uh, in Venice uh, and I saw the exhibition by Axel Kiefer and it was very powerful. And uh, when I actually came to the, uh, to the main exhibition space where it was, it was at the, uh, it, uh, how is it called? Not the Duke's, Duke's Palace, Palace. And uh, I really thought that this is something old master did because it was like amazing and all the context of the of, of the duke's palace and he was like uh the art piece was uh as powerful as some of the rembrandt uh works are or um yeah or michelangelo but the question yeah. is because uh, anselm kiefer is the same generation yeah uh, as that's, true. that's true that's so, true yeah he's yeah, he was born so in 1944 I'm or something much more like that. About, uh, younger generation. Younger generation. Because this is very similar. This is the, yeah, but the, the same, that was something I, I saw because he did it in his like they, late eighties. Yeah, because he did it like for the last three years, so it's a <coughs> brand new cool, but the, piece. I would say the roots and uh, experiences uh, are very similar. Mm -hmm. 60s, yeah. 60s, yeah, 70s. Yeah. 